without passion, life can start to look bleak. Without an intense burning for something greater or something more, our soul begins to decay. Yet most of us are content to live our lives mostly without it. We let passion spontaneously pop up in our lives at the beginning of a new relationship or when we become entrenched in a great book, but it's rarely something we pursue and it's certainly never something we actively try to cultivate. Yet, when we are fully entrenched in our passion, we are the most alive and happy we ever feel. Perhaps we are content not to cultivate it because passion comes packaged with a downside, something we rarely talk about, but that we all know exists, a liability that promises the come down will be just as great as the initial uptick in happiness, sometimes even worse. But still, for one reason or another, we were put here with an insatiable desire to create, to strive and to triumph, as well as to face the inevitable crushing defeat that threatens to take us out of the game. And that's exactly the part that scares us back into our routines and our safe choices. And with that being read, I want to welcome you back to the 127 Fit Podcast. Today's guest is an author, endurance and mindset coach, veteran, athlete, podcaster, and finally, entrepreneur. Today's guest is Rick Alexander. Rick, I want to welcome you to the 127 Fit Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And so, Rick, we're going to just kind of jump into a warm-up and uh, just kind of ask you a couple questions to kind of get the ball rolling with the podcast and the interview. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you, how, how do you start your day? And um, is there some sort of kind of morning routine or a couple things that you like to do to kind of kick off your, your day? Yeah, so for me, it's like in the morning, I think, because the world hasn't sort of like started getting into your thoughts, you sort of have, like for me at least, I have space, I have a lot more mental clarity in the morning, so I journal, I like to, I usually go to a coffee shop and I'll just do some free flow journaling, some, just sort of see what pops up, like because, you know, as the day goes on, like if you were to journal at the end of the day, at least for me, my thoughts are so influenced by everything I've seen, environmental cues, so this idea that I get to like kind of make sense of my world before the world tries to make sense of it for me, that's typically how I start my day. Okay, cool. Um, now, talking about books, is there a favorite book that you've had throughout your life um, that maybe you gift often, or is there a book that you're, you're currently reading that, that you're really enjoying and, and getting a lot out of? Yeah, so there are a few books that I gift. Uh, the Alchemist I gift, uh, also Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and 12 Rules for Life by George Peterson. Those are all the three that I give out pretty normal. Um, but right now I'm reading a book called The Happiness Hypothesis, and it's pretty incredible. So the psychologist basically looks at all this ancient wisdom from Christianity, Buddhism, Stoic philosophers, and then he sort of narrows it all down to 12 main points that they're all kind of saying, and then he backs it up with research today. Okay. And I think it's super important that we're like good stewards of wisdom. You know, I think today we, we're so technologically advanced that people tend to think that we're so much superior to everyone that's come before us. And my, I, my thing is like, no, they actually knew a lot about, like, especially like spiritual side of life and things like that. It's odd that we ignore that. And I like that he sort of like brought that back and backed it up with cool. stuff from today. Yeah. Now, I, I want to just touch on uh, Jordan Peterson because I know, um, I think he's been on uh, Jocko's podcast. I, I, I believe he's been on Joe Rogan probably more than once, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. um, he, he seems to be a name that's, that's popping up everywhere. Is, it, is there maybe like one or two things from Jordan Peterson that, that you've taken from um, maybe listening to some podcasts he's been on or reading his, his literature that, that, that you kind of hold on to and have been able to apply to your life? Man, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Like I, I really think, you know what I think is the things that he says is great because it resonates with a lot of people. Um, I know that the media has tried to make him kind of, I don't know, uh, They've tried to make him seem like he's sort of saying things that are taboo, and in my opinion, he's, he's really not that controversial. He's actually right. just saying, like, life things. Um, 
there's some things he said, whatever. Anyway, I think what the thing to take away from him is one of his rules for life is like, um, you know, do what is worthy, or and this isn't the exact words, but something like do what is worthy, not what is like enjoyable right now, right? So like this idea that you should delay gratification. He's actually the best example of that ever because he seems like an overnight success, but what people are forgetting to realize is that he spent uh, the last like three decades or two decades honing his craft, thinking about how he thinks about things. And so now it's like you can see these sort of like media to puppets for lack of a better word. all these people are like coming at him he's so solid in his thought process because he's so backed up right. that i'm like that everyone should strive to think about the world in the way that he thinks about it you don't even have to agree with him but like it, one of the things that stuck with me is he wrote a book called maps of meaning which is a great book but really difficult to read it took me a long time to get through but he spent 12 years basically sentence for sentence trying to argue his own points and trying to break them down like trying not straw manning his his opposition but like steel manning it right which is right. like really like what does the other side have to say about this and then is it right or is it wrong and so and so basically he's got this like body of wisdom that he spent so long cultivating that it's so solid and i think a lot of people could learn because a lot of us are just we get inputs and we just learn something and we're like, oh, I'm going to just adopt this and start saying it to people as if it's true. Right, right. And so the way that he thinks through it, I think, is the most beneficial. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing that. Do you have a favorite quote or mantra that uh, you kind of hold on to um, in, in your life day to day? Yeah. The Carl Jung quote, uh, until you make the subconscious conscious, it'll rule your life and you'll call it fate. Cool. Now, um, you are, uh, you have your own podcast called uh, Lionheart Radio, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I'm assuming because I have my own podcast and I that means I really enjoy listening to podcasts, so I'm assuming since you have your own podcast and you've been doing it for quite a while now, you probably enjoy listening to podcasts. Is there one or two podcasts that are kind of your go-to podcasts that you really enjoy and gain, gain a lot from? Yeah, I listen to I listen to Joe Rogan. Everyone does, but the big thing is like I look at it as in like what makes this guy so successful, and so that really intrigues me because I mean it's so he's ten times more successful than CNN right now, like right. as far as views go, which is mind blowing because there's no there's nothing between him and the audience, right? There's no barrier to entry, and so I'm just constantly like looking at this like what is making him so potent? And it's this weird mix of like. Comedy, which is like comedy allows you to be yourself no right. matter the culture, which is interesting. So he gets to say whatever he wants in the guise of comedy, yet he brings in these people with like very serious messages. Right, right. And so there's something about that combination that's so potent that I think is, is incredible. Cool. Now, uh, has there been a guest or two on the Joe Rogan podcast that you've, you've really appreciated listen, listening to? Yeah, I'm trying to think if I can think of anyone by name. I mean, obviously, the first Jordan Peterson interview I heard, it was before he had blown up. Okay. And I, I happened to listen to it. I was driving home from a uh, from 100 miler I'd ran, and it was like a long eight hour drive, and I had been running for 30 hours. So I was like, uh, j and whatever. So I'm driving home, and I'm like listening to this, and I'd never heard of this guy. I'd never heard of someone think about like, positioning good and evil in the way that he did right. and it was just like blow I'm like I sent it to everyone I knew it was like before you blew up I'm like you guys have to listen to this this is crazy yeah yeah now um, do you do you uh what do you what do you think of Jocko Willink because I know he's somebody that was kind of brought on to um you know the, the Joe Rogan podcast and then kind of I think through Joe Rogan maybe somebody else was encouraged to start his own podcast what what are your thoughts with with uh with Jocko I think he's um doing a lot of good for people like I think it's a mindset people could definitely benefit from I don't agree with all of his points yeah, um, do I. yeah. yeah, yeah. so I, I think um, like I think discipline has got to be the most overrated thing in the world um, anyone that's like you know the way that I always phrase it is like if, if you think there's utility in discipline quit eating sugar right now and then put uh, cookies on your counter and then just see how how much discipline takes away from your life right. as you try not to eat those cookies right, right. Um, I think it's a it's not the most efficient way to set up your life, mm -hmm. um, but could people benefit from discipline in today's day and age? Of course. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right, sweet. Appreciate you uh, just sharing that a little bit and giving us a little insight. So let's uh, <clears throat> let's kind of start digging in, uh, Rick, if you don't mind, to a little bit of like your, your background. Um, if you don't mind sharing kind of where you grew up and kind of like what the um, childhood was like, if you were involved in athletics and sports and just kind of the... Um, the unfolding of, of your younger years. Um, if, if you just want to kind of share a little bit, touch on that, that would be cool. 
I think, uh, so I grew up in Bath, Maine, which is like, uh, people think it's part of Canada. Like, it's so small. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you don't, it's the kind of town where not only does no one really leave, except for onesies, twosies here and there, not only does nobody really leave, but you don't even think that that's an option. Like, it just doesn't even enter your purview. Right. And when I was 16, I went to Hawaii to visit my aunt, and uh, she was, her husband was stationed in Hawaii in the military. And to me, it was like this moment of like, oh, there's an entire world beyond this world. And I sort of have realized, like, I strive to bring that out in my content, like in my podcast, my book. Like, if you read my book, the thing I want you to realize is that there's just so much more. Absolutely. Like, I write a lot about running and uh, adversity, and, and um, I've written a little bit about some of the military things just because of the adversity it's put me in. I think it's all great, but I don't care if you run. Like, that's the thing. People are like, well... I'm not a runner. I'm like, I, you need to just do something that's your thing. I don't right. care if it's running. It's like that turned out to be my medium, right? Mm -hmm. Running, biking, outdoor stuff. But for you, it's like I, I just want people to realize how much is beyond their sort Absolutely. of, you know, it's like this idea that it's like, I heard it one time and it's so stupid, but it's so true because we don't think about it. It's like, you're not a tree. Like, like you land somewhere right next to your parents and you grow up there. That's a good life plan for a tree. But that's not you. Like right. you have the option to completely blow your own mind, and I really think people should spend more time just figuring out what's out there. Cool. So, um, touching a little bit more on your upbringing stuff, were you? Uh, did you spend a lot, a lot of time like outdoors, and did you kind of pick up sports at an early age? Was sports and athletics and that type of stuff kind of a, a big part of your life growing up? It was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the biggest part of my life. Okay. To be fair, like I think I, I raced mountain bikes growing up. Cool. Um, so I, and I raced snowboards, so I did some unconventional type sports, got up to like junior pro mountain biker and then actually, uh, played football and lacrosse. And you know, for me, like I have such an addictive personality. Mm -hmm. Um, and I come from a family with like abuse problems, okay. um, not physical abuse, but like drug abuse, stuff yep. like that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, I just, I realize like, you know, a lot of, I think people sometimes they like look at people and they if they're acting in a way that they don't agree with or they were raised not to, they like look down on those people, right? Yep, absolutely. For me, I have this like such a clear understanding that the only reason I'm not, you know, like totally entrenched in drugs and alcohol right now is because I found sports mm -hmm. or sports found me even, right? right and right. so it's like my, I luckily had a parent that thrusted me into sports when I was like three and it became, that became the addiction of my life. So anytime the normal like high school stuff would sort of like come into my life, like a lot of the... Uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, stuff like mm -hmm. that that gets kids. Yeah. I had this other thing, and so for whatever reason, it was the main force. So it was like, even if I were to go party, like there was some part of me that always pulled back because I had practice on Monday. And if I if I partied on the weekend and then I got to practice and I was not performing at my peak, like I would punish myself. I'd run sprints after school. Right. Like that was me. I'd be like midnight and I'd be running sprints, yeah. hills, yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. So for me, it's like a, you just. Sports were the biggest part of my yeah, life, and continue yeah. to be. Cool, cool. Yeah. And and I and and I can say amen to that because for me, growing up, sports was was life. I mean, I went to school and got decent grades because if I didn't, I couldn't play sports. You know what I mean? It's like I I woke up, I ate, I slept, I breathed, I dreamed. Everything was sports up until um, I stopped playing after my freshman year in, in college. You know, and I feel like for youth, especially especially youth. Um, maybe that, that I grew up in, a, in Iowa in a small town of 5,000 people, you know, and so small town kind of where it's like, man, there's not really, is there a way out or you, you don't, it's kind of like you just take over your parents' business or mm. kind of just work at the local grocery store and maybe hopefully become a manager someday. Um, and for, so, so for maybe people like us, smaller towns, you know, the inner city youth, sports is just an amazing outlet, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I mean, we, we could look at our, you know, professional football players and basketball players and um, even, you know, Major League Baseball, um, a, a lot of those have, a lot of those athletes have similar stories of kind of the inner city, poverty, and if it wasn't for that sport or athletics growing up, you know, they're very clear, it's dead, addicted to drugs, or prison, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it's, it's just, I, I can't speak high enough about athletics and I know there's music and there's art and there's other outlets but just really in our culture in our country sports is is king sports is God and and you I really see that even being a, a, a teacher um, just that community building and camaraderie and um, the discipline that we touched on earlier it's just so much that you can learn through 
athletics, you know. So. I th- it, and, and you know what I think is cool about it is there's so much you can learn through m- many different levels of analysis, mm-hmm. right? So there's like the high school kid that doesn't do drugs or alcohol as much as his peers because he has sports. Right. I would say none at all, but like, let's be real. Mm-hmm. So you have sports, right? And then there's also the level of analysis, which is like from an academic standpoint, we have a system, which is school, which is designed to be a certain way. Yep. But the reality is like what we never talk about is how little people actually fit into that system. And when they don't fit in, we don't say like, oh, maybe you're in the wrong system. We say, be more like this kid that right. does fit in. Right. And so then you have sports come along. Like for me, I didn't care about school whatsoever. Literally, it was a place to see my friends, and it was I got to play sports. Yep. Yep. Beyond that, like the academic side, just it didn't resonate. I didn't care. I didn't read a single book, which is like a travesty because pre-show, we were talking about how much we both love to read. And exactly. I, I'm like, how screwed up was this that I – anyway, so I had sports, though, that always kept me there because it was like if I started not doing well in school, teacher would love like, you're going to be ineligible, and I'd be like, what do I have to do? Yep. And I would, yep. I would kill myself all weekend. Right. And so it's like and then there's the global level of analysis, which is the Olympics, which is like brings every it's like nothing does more for the world than sport. In my opinion, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you touched on the Olympics. I had this conversation with um, somebody here recently about how beautiful the Olympics are, because I I mean, it doesn't matter what's going on around the world. Now, I know there's been a few boycotts over over the decades or whatever. But outside of that, the Olympics literally brings all nations together and it, it's sport yeah it's sport like there there's there's nothing else that i can think of off the top of my head you know music or our art or or anything like that where literally the whole world basically doesn't come to a stop but in a sense it does and everybody's eyes are glued on the olympics for the two three weeks that are going on summer and and winter and it's it's just it's amazing there's, yeah. there's nothing else in the world like it you know yeah so, and you know, theoretically, we're supposed to not even fight during the Olympics. Like, wartime is right, supposed yeah, to... Like, it's yeah. crazy how how incredible that is. Mm-hmm. That, like, this... this We have such hatred in the world that we kill each other. Right. Sport is like, hold on. Hang out for just a minute. Yeah. And we all do. We all pause. It's like, yeah. that's fucking... That's crazy. It, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. It's, it's really, really cool. So... Cool. All right. So, <clears throat> I just want to touch on a, a, a little bit of... Um, your your military experience, if, if you don't mind, sure. was was that something that because you did mention um, just a few minutes ago, it sounds like there was some sort of military presence within your family uh, on some level. So um, was the military something that you grew up kind of having an understanding of and, and desiring to be a part of, and um, then did you enlist right at high school? How, what was kind of the genesis of of you um, being a part of, of the military? Yeah, I mean, I come from a, a just a patriotic background. Okay. Uh, when September 11th happened, like I was a freshman in high school, I watched it happen, and then like the second one, we literally watched happen on TV. And then there was essentially like looking at my life, there was nothing that would stop me from joining the military after mm-hmm. that. Like I was sold. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's sort of for me, it was direction, right? Because I still even tried to go to college. And I went for a year, I played lacrosse, and I was just like, I, kn- I was like, I don't know what I'm even doing here. I don't right. have direction, I don't know what I want to do. I was always jealous of people that are like 18, they're like, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm like, damn, how do you know that? Right, like, right. I know, all I know is that I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, for me, it was like, all of a sudden, it was like the military was like, hey, there's this really hard thing you could go do. It's going to, you know, for me, it was direction, it was mm-hmm. a way to focus my efforts, it was... You know, it was everything I needed at, at that age, and, and yeah, so then I had, had a good career. Yeah, so you, you enlisted then right right out of high school then? And you, I, I went to a year of college, and then oh, I went in. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. And um, if you don't mind me asking, what, what branch did you serve in? I was in the Navy. Okay. So the Navy right, has cool. two branches of Special Forces. They have mm-hmm. SEAL and they have SWIC, mm-hmm. and so I was SWIC. Okay. Um, so go through like a combined orientation and then into our own selection process. Yeah. Um, so the end of my career, I actually got to be an instructor. I got to be a BUDS instructor, cool, so... Cool. Um, you know, 300 kids a year that want to be SEALs or SWIC would come through, and mm-hmm. it was just really great to be a part of that. Yeah, and um, all of all of the Navy starts off, wh- whether you're going into Special Forces or just like the regular big Navy, they all start off in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois, correct? And yeah. Then, and then you guys kind of break off from there? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. funny story. Cool. Like, when I went through, the Navy was just trying to professionalize the Special Forces, so... Mm-hmm. I'll just give you a super fast background. Basically, 
how it used to be is you'd come in, you'd pick a job like cook or mechanic or whatever you wanted to do, mm-hmm. and then if you wanted to be some kind of special operations, you'd go to selection, but you'd maintain your job. When I came in, they were like, no, if you want to be special operations, that'll be your job, which was a great move. However, they didn't have it ironed out. So there's this thing called SEER school, which is survive, evade, resist, escape. So basically, they throw you into this place. It's in California, but they make it seem like it's overseas. Everyone speaks it. It's like crazy. Right. Everyone speaks a different language. Then you get rounded up. They bring you to a prisoner of war camp, and you're taught how to deal with being a prisoner of war. Well, the Navy screwed up and made that my first school in the Navy. So I went to boot camp. I'm 19 years old, yeah. scared out of my mind. Yep. Boot camp and then this school. Wow. And so I'm sitting there in this like cement little thing that's like two by two. <laughs> and I'm like, I haven't eaten in a week. I lost 17 pounds. Wow. I'm all bruised up from getting shit kicked, getting beat up. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and I'm just like thinking like, man, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I screwed up bad joining the military. <laughs> it was like it was no, no on-ramp. It was right, like right. boot camp. Boom, you're just it was it. on, right? And, and sometimes though, that might that might be okay because when you're at that age, you can't you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. Because as you get older, you kind of you have a little bit more life experiences, and it it might. So I think sometimes in life, it's okay not to know, and you just you just jump in, right? Yeah, best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, it's wild, cool. but you're right. Because if I'd gone now, I'd know it was a game, and I'd <laughs> right, be like, right. "Hey, dude, I'm not listening to you." Yeah, yeah. But when I was 19, scared out of my mind. You know, it was like I got the full benefit of what that school is supposed to provide. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's yeah. cool, man. I, I appreciate that. Um, now, just one more thing I just want to ask you about, Rick, in regards to your uh, military experience and career. Is there one lesson that you um, were able to, and I'm sure there's a lot more, but, you know, just for, for time's sake or whatever, is there one lesson that you kind of hold on to up to this point in your life that, that you learned through your experience and, and career in the military? Mm. I would say, honestly, yes. So the day that I got home from SEER school, so I'd been out in the field for two weeks, 19 years old, lost 17 pounds, uh, you know, totally just bru- broken lip, bruised ribs, I was hurting. Uh, I get back to my barracks room, and this is, barracks rooms are not nice, right? right. Like, we're talking a twin crap bed with no, ma- I mean, it's awful. Mm-hmm. One, like, wool blanket, super itchy, <laughs> and one pillow. And I remember I get home, I get in this bed, and I've never been so happy in my entire life to just enjoy this crappy room Mm -hmm. that I was alone in with no bed, stomach hurt, and I was just so happy. And in that moment, I realized that uh, comfort and happiness are just, they're not related like we think they are. And in fact, like the further you're able to get yourself into the discomfort, the the, actually the happier you are with normal stuff. But we all just, you know, we basically soak up all of this comfort that we have now all of these like creature comforts iphone order order your groceries through an app like you don't you don't have to do anything and this is something that back in you know however long ago you believe we existed we were literally this was getting food was life and death right right? now it's an app on your phone so you have to go out and you have to find this discomfort if you want to feel any kind of contentment in your life Mm -hmm. because we were not the world that formed us was not the world we live in now. Exactly. And so your biology hasn't caught up to all of this technology. Uh, so for me, that's the biggest lesson I've ever learned, and that's what I wrote my first book about. Cool, cool. Uh, perfect transition, because I, I wanted to touch on writing, um, what, what writing means to you, because you said one of the main things that you do every day to start off your day is, is journaling. Then, you know, in the introduction, uh, we touched on you being an author, and you, you just mentioned your, your first book that you wrote. And if, if um, I remember correctly from doing a little bit of research about you, you've got a, another book that's coming out th- this summer? Is that one yeah. that's coming out? Okay, so yeah. you've got another book on the way. So what does is, what is writing mean to you, and what does writing provide for you in, in your life, Rick? Mm, that's a kind of a deeper question actually <laughs> so like reading for me is how I make sense of the world okay. but writing is how I make sense of my world Perfect. right it's how Perfect. I organize my thoughts because you know we're all and I think anybody whether you're a writer or not should journal and the reason I think that is because you have all of these thoughts bouncing around your head 24 7 and you need to add structure to them to make sense of them to see what they mean to see if they, they're even valid you've got fears that aren't even real that are just you're building up in your mind so writing helps make sense of all that that's like the first level and the second level is um, you know I think any writer that's worth their salt realizes that they're it's not coming from them so to me it's a connection to whatever you believe the divine the universe to something way bigger than myself mm-hmm. because there's so, there are multiple times in fact this morning was one of them 
where I write for like an hour and I'm like, I didn't know that. I literally didn't know that before I wrote it. And so whether it's a muse, whether it's whatever you, you believe, but for me it's like I'm tapping into something, this like internal resonance that is so much deeper than myself. And to be able to be that is just an incredible experience for me. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. For me, does, does, does writing, can you sit down and just, if something is really in your heart and just burning inside of you, does, does, does writing come pretty easy for you? Or, 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 or do you, I mean, do you get kind of locked up and you got to like, man, I got to, how, how does that work? Because for me, I can, if, if there's something inside of me, man, give me a pen, pe a piece of paper, and it, I mean, it just, it just comes out. It's just so natural. Is that kind of how it is for you or is it a little bit more of a, of a harder process. No, it's so natural. Cool, um, cool. It's always been my creative outlet. I mean, I was Me that too. weird kid in seventh grade, like writing in my room by myself, right, like right. writing poetry <laughs> or whatever, you yeah, know, like yeah. just super weird. Um, but I look back and it's like my whole life I've been writing. It's like, yeah, I was, I was born to do this. I really do believe that. Um, so I do get locked up sometimes, but also, uh, yeah, no, it just comes out. You know, one thing I'll say to you though, that's a, that I'm struggling with right now because you mentioned this book that I'm writing. In the beginning of this book, I was going through like a really tough time in life. The book is fire. <laughs> now that like things are kind of, I mean, I live in Colorado. I snowboard four times a week. Like I live my ideal life, really. Right, right. It's it's a little. The writing's different. It's not as there's a there's not as much depth or something. I'm trying to figure that out because yeah. I'm like you know it's like that quintessential cliche tortured writer, but I'm like. I also do realize how how well I was writing in these times yeah, yeah. of discomfort. Yeah, and I, I think too, for, for me, it's just like, we, we all go through different seasons of life and my writing always reflects whatever season I'm going through. And so sometimes, like you just said, maybe you're like, man, I'm trying to figure out there's something maybe missing from this writing, but if that's where you're at in the season that you're in, then if, if that's coming like purely from your heart, then that's, that's just where you're at. You right. I mean, but I think... For me, it's just like when I am going through a struggle or there's some really deep things in my heart, my soul, my spirit, just like, and I write it out, I'm just like, sometimes I'm like, I read, I'm like, dude, like, <laughs> it kind of blows my mind that I, that I wrote that. But yeah. it's just, it's so passionate, so deep inside, and it just comes out. And then like you said, other times where it's like, you write, and you're just like, yeah, you know, that's where I'm at right now, but it's not it's not as much fire or whatever as, as maybe some previous stuff, but... Mm. It's, you know, I, I just think it's important for all of us human beings to have those outlets in our lives where we can kind of just get rid of the stuff that's inside, get rid of the, the stuff that's inside of our heart, inside of our mind. And, and, and I can just say amen again to what you were saying in, regard, in regards to writing because writing has been such a big and impactful part of my life. Like, because mm -hmm. there's so many thoughts that's inside of our mind. There's constantly do thousands and thousands of thoughts coming in and out every day. There's so much stuff inside of our heart and our, our, our spirit and everything. It's like, for me, when I can get that stuff onto a piece of paper, it's just like, I, I'm releasing it. Mm. And I, I just feel, I feel better and I feel lighter. Cause it's like, okay, that's on a piece of paper. It's, it's good to go. Yes. You know what I mean? It's just like making a grocery list. It's like, dude, I gotta get this, this. And if I don't immediately write that down or put it in my phone, then it's just like, it's kind of, it's stuck in my mind. I'm like, oh, I gotta go to the grocery store. Did I remember this? But as soon as I write down, it's kind of released. Yeah. Is that do you kind of feel the same way when you with with your writing? Like once you get it down, it's kind of released from you, and you can kind of move on to the next thing. Or yeah, yeah, and I think that's why they say like keep a journal by your bed if you're someone that has like because me, I cannot turn my brain off to save my life, and so sometimes at night, like that's the thing. I'm like, let me just get all of this out, no matter what it is, right. like stream of consciousness, mm -hmm. and then maybe I can sleep. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but that's also why I think people. I think everyone should be in therapy. Like, you just got to work your stuff out. Absolutely. Like, you got to make sense of the world. You know, our brains work on a concept called coherence, which is you have to make sense of the world or you feel lost. Mm -hmm. And so, like, one plus one plus one always has to equal three. And so, for me, like, one of the ways I maintain coherence in my life is to write about it. That way I can, like, put these thoughts somewhere productive. Cool. All right. Very good. Now, <clears throat> the name of your first book was uh – Burn your couch. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So, listeners, if you're out there and you're you're uh, interested in, in checking out um, Rick's book, his first book, it's called Burn Your Couch. So, just Amazon. They, they yeah. Go to Amazon and yeah. Burnyourcouch.com. Okay, Amazon. Cool. Whatever. All right. Very good. So, I want to talk about now, just kind of moving along your life story, Rick. We we kind of touched on the childhood and then the military experience. Um, 
when when did uh, well let's just talk about kind of like your physical training because obviously with um, the, the the special forces that you were involved in within the Navy there was you know um, some upper level physical training so did the physical training from like sport when you were growing up and then in the military was has it has that just kind of always been a part of you and then maybe another one of those outlets that has been something where you can kind of get rid of that energy and just kind of get lost in that in that physical training and then out of the military what what is all of the endurance uh, kind of the long distance running and, and all of that type of stuff kind of come come to fruition mm. so i mentioned i like didn't i didn't fit in the school system really right. well like, it's not how i'm set up i don't mm-hmm. Okay. So for me, I think fitness was the times when I felt understood. Okay. I felt like it was an expression of me that wasn't missing, like wasn't off. It mm-hmm. did fit in. Like I was good at sports, like naturally just uh, athletic. And so for me, like I was captain of the football team cap- and I didn't, I was like, I'm not apologizing for not doing my homework. I just fit here, I, yeah. you know? And so for me, fitness has always been that. I think the, the bummer to that is that I, I have this whole intellectual side of me that I didn't know. I was like, I'm not going to college because I hate school, right? right? The reality is, like, I love learning maybe more than anybody I know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. like, I'm, and I'm a huge nerd. And I, like, for whatever reason, the system didn't work for me like that. And so, um, yeah, for me, sports has been the time where I, I like, I fit into the world, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, so then, so then like, the, your, your physical training then from sport, your physical training within the military. So did that, once you uh, were done with the military, I'm assuming that just kind of carried over into – the, the next season and the next phase of life. And then, so when, how did you get involved with these um, like ultra runs and all of that type of stuff? Was that something that you kind of caught your eye while you were still in the military or was that something kind of post-military that you started to uh, jump into? When I was 18, I had dropped out of college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. I was dating the same girl from my hometown and that stupid on and off again relationship. Yep, yep. Like, this is going to get dragged on for way too many years. Yep. Uh-huh. And um, I I read this book called Ultra Marathon Man by okay. Drew Carnassus. Yep, I've read and, uh, Yeah, and um, man, it, it was just like, I couldn't believe, it was so extreme to me that people could do this. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm going through this difficult time. One night, uh, it's like six o'clock, and we had just broken up for like maybe the tenth time, and I'm like, <laughs> God, I'm just like miserable, and I leave my house in this ridiculous Dean Carnassus moment. I like leave my house, didn't even shut the door. I was just like, I'm out of here, yeah. and I run to my next town over, and then I run to the next town, and the next town, and I end up running like 30 miles, wow. and I get home at like, actually my family was all like worried about me, so it's like 3 a.m., and I'm running back. And I'm out of it. And they pick me up. They see me, pick me up. I don't even recognize them. I'm so out of it. And uh, I sleep. I wake up every 10 minutes from crazy, like, fits of cramps. And that was the first. But I was so good. Like, right. I was so content. I had my thoughts I felt like were worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, I had something else to focus on. So that was, like, the first, like, time realizing how big this was in my life. Okay, cool. And then if I look at my whole life, it's like every time I've hit a point of resistance, um, like, I was building up this supplement company in San Diego. And I was working so much that I like, I was living in the fitness industry and I was the most unfit I'd ever been. Right. And so my reaction, I signed up for a hundred miler mm-hmm. and just went out and it was like, actually I didn't make it. I didn't even train for it. I got 74 miles, 72 miles in, got pulled because of the time cap, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, 72 miles on, <laughs> I could, yeah. So I was really banged up anyway. So I realized that it's always been my go-to, you know, and I, I really hope, like I, I wish everyone had their go-to, which is why I always tell people do everything that you're interested in. Mm-hmm. Just try it. Maybe you find that you like the idea of it more than you actually like the thing. And that's right. just as valuable because it's not bouncing around your head mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not like the what if or I could have been. Um, but then also you'll find things you do that do resonate with you. And like I think everyone should have that outlet because no matter how bad things are for me, I do know that I can go for a run and it like cool. will change everything. Yeah. So do you consider yourself then a, an ultra runner or just kind of like a – a fitness enthusiast or a fitness junkie because you I know on your Instagram and you mentioned earlier you're you're snowboarding three four times a week now that you live out here in Colorado um, and I think you've been involved in CrossFit and stuff in the past yep. quite quite heavily so yep. is it just kind of fitness is just kind of your jam it's kind of doesn't matter really what it is as long as you're being physical it's it's cool with you or yeah I, I just you know flow state like movement yeah. I you know same thing like so I think yeah if I really think about it it is that thing for me it's like I feel like I'm more of an explorer, cool. right? Yeah. Like I'm, I get interested in something and I want to like dive deep and I want to figure it all out. Mm-hmm. 
and I'll like I'll get in the research and I'll read textbooks and I'll interview athletes and that's the cool thing about having a podcast, right? Because yeah, like yeah. I've had Dean Carnassus on my show, the yeah. guy that inspired my life. It was like <laughs> For sure. now I get to talk to him, Absolutely, right, and pick yeah. his brain on my training and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I, it, for me, it's like I consider myself to be just exploring different frontiers. Yeah. And then um, people like we jump around a lot. I'm like, well, if I feel like doing something else, I do something yeah. else. Yeah. Sorry that you don't feel free to do that. Yeah. <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Have you ever uh, done any type of obstacle course racing or anything? A little bit. Um, like I've done some tough mutters. I have some athletes I train for Spartan races. Okay, I have an cool. elite Spartan racer actually. Um, but yeah, they're fun. Yeah. They're well, fun. In, in the military, I mean, that's kind of the thing where it's like, you know, if, if you've actually, you know, served in the military and, and the, the, you know, the, the area that you were in, it's like, dude, like that's just, it's just another day of life. I yeah. Mean, and now we, 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 in our culture in America, we, we are manufacturing you know, the quote unquote obstacles and we're manufacturing all of this Literally. discomfort and stuff. And so for, I, I ran a Spartan race uh, out here in, in Colorado Springs when they came to Fort Carson. And I'm kind of like you, I've, I've, I've done the bodybuilding, the powerlifting, also of course, uh, you know, half, half marathon. I've, I've dabbled in a lot of different stuff because I'm kind of like you, I'm, I'm kind of a free spirit explorer. I like to be able to say, hey, I've done that. And I, when I did the obstacle course race, it, it was cool, but I don't think I'll probably ever to do it again because it's just like if I want to if I want to go out and quote unquote kind of like you know conquer some op obstacles or something like dude I'm gonna go climb like a, a mountain exactly like real life rocks and whatever and there's animals and stuff. like kind of the whole like hey we're gonna just climb this rope and the manufactured stuff like it just there's something inside of me it just it just doesn't jive with me I I, I just and it's it kind of the whole culture like oh yeah we're Spartans and stuff like. Yeah, kind of, but not really. Yeah. You know what I mean? You kind of feel that way, too. Not not to put anything down, because everybody's got their jam. Everybody's got their thing. But I'm just saying, for me personally, kind of all this manufactured stuff, it's just like, why don't you just go climb a mountain? Yeah. Especially when you live out in Colorado. Yeah, like, right. We can walk out our, our, our back door, dude, and walk five miles, and there's all kinds of just natural obstacles. I mean, where, where are you at with your mindset in regards to kind of... That type of stuff. So I see the value in it for the population because there's a lot of people that would not go find that adversity in right. any other way. And so when it's packaged neatly and you get to go sign up and you get to like go play Spartan, right? Like, and you get a medal. And you get <laughs> a, medal. a medal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like I totally get – you know what I think is I feel like the fact that CrossFit and, uh, and obstacle horse racing have created this somewhere around like $6 billion economy just blew up out of thin air. When we're the most comfortable we've ever been, I think that is so telling about our society and right. how badly uh, adversity is hardwired into our DNA or the need for adversity. Mm -hmm. And so I think the fact that these things are blowing up, it really tells you where our culture is and what what our needs are biologically, right? Because right. it makes no sense. Why would you pay to go be in the mud and jump over walls when you can order your groceries from a phone and watch Netflix all day? For sure. Right? Yeah. It's because some part of you isn't satiated with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with you. Cool. So <clears throat> let's talk about, I want to, I want to ask you about vision and, um, you know, maybe kind of like goals and just having a, a, a direction in your life, because that's something that you had mentioned when you were younger, you kind of had the sports, but then you, you kind of went, tried to go to college, dropped out. And there was maybe just a, a period or two in your life where there was just like, Hey, what, what am I going to do with my life? Right. You kind of mm -hmm. mentioned, me mentioned that and touched that. But now, as I've followed you on Instagram and, 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 again, done a little bit of research about you, you seem like you are very focused. You, you know who you are. You know what you stand for, and, or at least you're, you're learning about all that in your life. Um, and then on your website, there's something that I found this morning uh, called a Clarity Academy. Mm -hmm. And so what's the importance in your life and other people's lives, Rick, of having clarity, having vision, having goals, and moving in uh, a direction, going back to the initial reading uh, to introduce you that you wrote about passion. So what, what's the importance of all of that in, in, in your life and in somebody else's life, having that clarity and direction and, and kind of that passion focus? I've had like so many moments of like, what, what am I doing right now and why am I doing it? And I think a lot of people have those. Or, or you get to what you wanted to get to. So that was me. Like I would achieve the thing, like run the 200 and I would finish – and then I would wonder, but like, why don't I feel satiated right now? Like, why do I still feel empty? So if you think about it, like the thing that I, the realization I came to, and I, this was sort of born out of some pretty dark times in my own life, but that there's so many things that make you, you there's personality. And then there's 
ego, and then there's a higher self, and then there's um, all of these subconscious, like there's guilt, and there's fear, and there's coping mechanisms. So the thing is, I would set goals. Sometimes I would get them in spite of myself, but they weren't authentic goals. And what I realized is that if you want to take all of your humanity and be able to move it in a cohesive direction, like all the things that you are, then you have to be aware of all that you are. Because what I realized is nobody knows themselves at all. Like you have no idea what you really want. You have no idea. If I were to go to everyone in this library right now, and I was like, hey, I have a wand. I'm going to wave it tomorrow. You'll wake up with your perfect life. People would say the stupidest stuff because right. they have no idea what they really want. Right. They would say stuff like, I want to be on a beach with a, this is a thing I got from Jordan Peterson. People would say, I want to be on a beach with a lot with unlimited money and you would just drink Mai Tais, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you would be fat and miserable in a month. In two months, you'd be depressed. Yep. In six months, you'd probably think about suicide because right. you have nothing in your life that you actually want. Mm -hmm. And so you have no worthy struggle, right? And so my whole new book in the Clarity Academy is all about self-discovery, self-exploration, figuring out who you really are, what you really want. You know, I rail on school a lot, but it's really because they teach us what to think and not how to think, and that is such a problem for me. Um, and so the Clarity Academy is designed to help people think about their life in a productive way. So it's like, how do you think about yourself? How do you think about these things that you do? Um, like, how do you, do you, most people don't even know they have a shadow side. They just get mad, but don't know why they're actually mad. Right. And so it's like, the more you learn about yourself, the more positioned you are to do whatever it is you want in life and to feel more content, to not feel like, most people feel like they're two feet below the surface of the water at all times. And it's because they're giving themselves to all of these different things in their lives, their kids, their responsibilities, but they don't know who are they, like what do they want, what makes them feel centered and gives them energy. And so they go to coping mechanisms for these things instead of actually finding the thing that they should be doing in this, right. in this world, right? And I think mm -hmm. if you look, like all these pacifiers we have in our life, Instagram, porn, like there's unlimited things for you to take your time so that you don't have to think about what you really want and what you should be really doing. Exactly. And so I really, I want this course, like, I mean, it's how I make money, but I also am like, I, I'm constantly thinking about how can I get this to more people because I want everybody to have that opportunity. Right. Now, <clears throat> for me personally, spending time just with my own self and in, in my own thoughts has been a very powerful and valuable part of who I am and, and me realizing what, what I'm passionate about, why I'm here on this earth. Is, is that something that is really important for us as human beings? Because even, and we've talked about, you know, we just mentioned the social media and we're so plugged in, there's so much stuff going on, especially when you're m married or in a relationship, you have kids and career. I mean, life is so chaotic and most of the time it's because we, we bring that on ourselves and it's the society we live in. And if you don't keep up with the Joneses, then who are you, you know? But as a human being, kind of going back just to who we are at, at the raw and, and core, do you, do you feel, Rick, that it's very, very important for us to kind of unplug and check out at different times and in different seasons just to spend alone time to really dig deep into that inner being? I do. The most personal growth I've ever had in my life was when I went on a, it was like six guys, we did this boat trip around Maine, we basically like rode this boat around Maine, and it was uh, like the coast of Maine. And so for six days we had no cell phones, all we did is meditate, we journaled, we thought about what we really wanted, and it's funny because the first two days I was, there was so much resistance, like I wanted my phone back, I wanted to, by 72 hours, I was so crystal clear on what I wanted, who I wanted to be, I slept better, it was insane what had happened in 72 hours so much so that once the trip was over after like five or six days I got my phone back I turned it on and I instantly shut it back off because I was like overcome with the world coming back yeah. in and I was like I want to just feel me for like two more seconds before I allow all this and so yeah I mean look the world's giving us inputs like you're you're exposed to 11,000 sensory inputs per minute or something uh -huh. like that and so and so you just you don't know how you feel about stuff because you're constantly battling everything else, right? Right. And so, yeah, I think it's super important. Cool. <clears throat> now, with that being said, what's the value and importance of, of having a solid community around you? Mm, yeah, so I think, you know, in my book, I'm writing about, like, how do you create meaning in your life? One of the ways that I've discovered is, is through connection, right? It's connection with people, it's connection with the world around you. Um, we, we, were, we grew up in tribal, we're tribal creatures, right? And so uh, if you, you can, like, you know, people are introvert and extrovert, and that's 
you know, if you look at it, it's like that's how you derive energy. But almost nobody is all of one thing. And I think that's where we screw this up. So people are like, I'm an extrovert or I'm an introvert. I don't need people. The reality is you're 60% introvert, 40% extrovert. So there's 40% of you that does need connection or 10% or 2%, but there's part of you that needs it. And if you would give yourself that part, if you'd allow yourself that connection, you would feel much more content, like your life had more meaning. Okay, cool. <clears throat> now, I want to touch on being an entrepreneur. That that word <laughs> seems like in our culture now, it's kind of like, yeah. The, the, the cool thing. It's the rock star I mean, of our time. Yeah, yeah. 100%. It's, it's the cool thing. Everybody, you know, go on Instagram, entrepreneur, entrepreneur. And, and just so for the listeners out there, I, you know, I put down you as an entre- entrepreneur. That's not something that, you know, that you're saying that, hey, I'm, a, I'm Rick Alexander. I'm an entrepreneur. That's just something I wrote down to describe you yeah, yeah. as I was researching you and digging a little deeper in, in regards to your, your life and story. So um, I just want to put that out there for the listener. But you, you are an entrepreneur. You, you have started businesses and different things like that. What 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 is maybe the greatest lesson or, or a lesson that you would like to share with myself and the listeners, Rick, that um, as being an entrepreneur that, that maybe you've, you've learned that you would like to share so that maybe um, we would maybe avoid something or, hey, if you want to start your own business or start something, hey, think about this. Is there kind of one or two things that you would maybe – um, just some advice in regards to entrepreneurship that you'd like to share that people like if they want if they're thinking about doing it Yeah, yeah, if they're thinking about doing it or maybe they're just kind of you know Starting something and it's like hey before you go to that next step or that next level Think about this or look look at this. Yeah, I call I coined this term in my book called the low-risk probe okay. and essentially what that is is like in the business world it would be the MVP the minimal viable product like what how can you try this thing with the most minimal amount of investment, time, uh, resources, you know, investment of yourself? Uh, because the, the reality is you might like the idea of it way more than you like it. Because mm-hmm. entrepreneurship is kind of miserable in a lot of ways. I don't think I'm set up for nothing else. Like I realize how unemployable I really am. Um, but the, the reality is like it's a really tough way to go. And that's kind of what it's, we're doing a disservice because we're telling everyone like this, you could be a rock star. And it's like, yeah, you don't know where your food's coming from next week. So, like, think about that. (laughs) I would say test it with the most minimum investment possible. And then realize, do you like it or not? And then start going in that way. But people start out, they're like, I'm going to start this brand. And I I did the same thing. Like, I want to be in the fitness industry, so I'm going to start a clothing company. And so I started a t-shirt company, and I'm getting keychains made and water bottles and nothing that matters for a business. I had no idea. And I realized I wasn't even in the fitness industry. I was in the textile industry. Right. And so you need to like, you need to do it minimally so that you can see if you're, if it's even what you think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now taking a step back to what we were just talking about previously before entrepreneurship about knowing yourself and, you know, having this passion and vision, all that for your life. That would probably be the number one thing if you were thinking about starting your own business or maybe starting a, a side passion project. Like you need to know who you are first, right? Before you dive into entrepreneurship or trying to go out there and conquer the world with whatever you think you want to conquer the world with, right? I mean, is that kind of like, hey, know what you're all about first and then maybe step out and, and go after whatever you think you want to go after. Yeah, that was actually going to be point number two for me. Okay. So one okay. thing I realized is all the businesses I started before I got into self-discovery, they were, they were started out of my ego, which isn't me. My ego is a protective mechanism of how I navigate the world, but it's not truly me. And so all the companies I started, I, I favored things like I wanted to – like we sponsored way too many models that we got no return on. Like I just did stupid things because I didn't know me. And what I realized is once I leaned into who I was – And I really started getting coaching on it and taking the time to figure out what I really wanted for my life. My business growth was parallel to my personal growth. Cool. Yeah. And I, so don't skip that part. Right. That's, that's, that's a nugget right there. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. What, what's the importance of mindset in in your life and not, not necessarily just for like your um, physical side of your life, but just day to day being Rick Alexander and just trying to make it through each day, living the moment, living the life that you want to live here in Colorado. What What's the importance of mindset and just having control over your thoughts and, and just being kind of set in, in the direction that you want to go? I think, honestly, to me, what I think people need to understand is that you aren't your thoughts. Like, you know, we go through things in life and we pick them up and then they become us. So like we get mad because someone cut us off and now 
we're angry. But the reality is, like, I'm not angry. I'm Rick, and I'm going through this emotion of anger, and I don't have control over that all the time. But I also have the ability to objectify thoughts. And I think we think, because thoughts, we don't even know where thoughts come from, first of all. So, like, nobody knows where a thought comes from. Right, right. So, like, let's just get super clear. Like, we don't know where this is coming from. And so you don't have to own it. It's not you. You have random thoughts that pop up in your head. Like, but if you have a direction for your life, like, think about that direction and then think about every thought and whether it's getting you closer to that direction or not. Like, that's why I, I always, I'm so big on meditation. It allows you to, like, it almost allows you to be behind your mind, to look at your thoughts and objectively assess them. And so when it comes to mindset, like, for me, you know, there's mental toughness and there's all these things. But if you, if you are so entrenched in your own thoughts that you don't know how to separate you from your thoughts then that's where you need to start in the mindset piece, you know? Like, if you think, I used to think I was mentally tough because I could run 200 miles or because I was special forces, and then I would read a post on Facebook about a political candidate I didn't agree with and I'd get bent out of shape. You're not mentally tough, you just know how to do one thing well, right. you know? Like, maybe you know how to shut off the demons for a second and finish a, a big event. It doesn't make you mentally tough if a, a opposing opinion can take your day down or, or even point. your hour, right? It's like that, it's no bearing on you, and you need to understand like how separate you are from some of these things. Cool. That's 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 some that's some good stuff right there, man. Yeah. Um, what's what's your uh, what do you believe is your your greatest strength? Ooh, my greatest strength is to suffer for a really long time without dying, cool. and I mean that so seriously. Like my life path, it's like I'll find every single way that doesn't work. I'll find every hard road. I'll turn over every rock, and. You know, out of a hundred thousand rocks that turn into failure, I'll find the one that works, and I'll piece that together. Um, so resilience to me is it's everything's been. So me. what's what's the the value in suffering? Yeah, um, man, I think that it gives an unbiased look into your soul. Who are you in adversity? And this is something I would tell my students when I was a, a buzz instructor. It's like, look, I don't we do this thing called a brick tread where you have to tread water and keep a brick above the water. And it's like five minutes and it's pretty controlled. When you're in it, it feels like friggin' chaos, especially if you're not a, like confident in the water. The thing I always tell everybody is like, look, we're not looking for the person that's a good brick treader. Like, I don't care if that's like a skill you have. I'm looking for the person that gets their back against the wall, has absolutely no option and still goes forward. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, I think suffering, it teaches you about yourself I would say maybe that's probably pain. Suffering's like normally, I think we think about those two as the same and they're, they're not always. Suffering's sometimes like something you'll put into. Right. But you get to take suffer. I just think it teaches you about yourself. It teaches you about your character. And one thing when it, we're talking about fitness that I think people don't take advantage of enough is like you get the opportunity to put your back against the wall in fitness before life does it for you. The thing is, life's going to do it for you. You have no Absolutely. idea if your house burns down tonight. Like you have no idea if you find yourself in, you know, heaven forbid, a, a shooting, a public shooting, like you put your back against the wall in as many different ways as possible so that when life does it, you get to meet it on your terms and not life's terms. Mm -hmm. Because if not, you're gonna be scared, you're not gonna know what to do, or you're gonna find yourself in a position that you feel like you can't get out of. Put yourself in enough of those positions and you'll realize that you're the kind of person that always gets out of it. Yeah. You know, one thing I used to do is I'd run to the gym eight miles away and I would do nothing but train legs for two hours so I couldn't walk, and I'd be like, get yourself home. Like, just little things like that that, like, people don't think about. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it, there's a lot of value in putting yourself in an awful situation and right. realizing that you are the kind of human that can get out of it. Mm -hmm. So by us as human beings putting ourselves through suffering or discomfort, we are preparing ourselves then, both mentally and physically, for the 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 difficulties and the sufferings of life you don't get to get out of pain right nobody does right. it's just as much a part of the human experience as laughing yeah. or crying or being happy mm -hmm. and so uh yeah and so you have to figure out a way to manage this stuff that's going to happen to you and so for me it's like why wouldn't you put yourself in that position like when you get to figure out how you'd react you know one of the things like when i got really into ultra running people would always be like oh you're not gonna be able to walk when you're older and you're gonna have knee problems and whatever okay and then I remember I ran this 100 miler, one of the most brutal in my life on the East Coast. And I was, uh, at a, I was at a bar with my girlfriend that night, like getting a drink. And the bartender slipped in the back and he took a Percocet and he came back out. And he was like, hey, thanks, man. Sorry, I just had to take a Percocet. And I was like, oh, what's up? He's like, well, I've been working for five hours, so I, did, I like, can't be on my legs that long. And in that moment, I realized, like, oh, we're just choosing our pain. Like, 
I suffered in the mountain. I'll never have to take a perk set to stand for five hours, ever. Right. Like, I chose to go beat pain there. You chose not to, and now you have to go meet it in the kitchen with a perk set. And so it's kind of like that manifests itself in many different ways. But just I realized, like, nobody gets to get out of pain. You might as well choose to go to it on your terms. I like it. Yeah. Good. So I, I asked you a minute ago what your um, <clears throat> greatest strength is. What do you believe is your greatest weakness or the, the area in your life that you're trying to, to work on um, to kind of bring, bring, bring that up or level that up in your life? Yeah, for me, it's, it's probably empathy. Empathy. Yeah, like I just wasn't born with it for whatever reason, very cut off to it. Um, don't always think about how other people, like how they think. You know, we think the thing about personality and value sets that we don't understand, and this is the, this is the value in discovering who you really are, is you realize that all your values, they don't just affect how you show up in the world, they affect how you see the world, right? And so having empathy allows you to see that other people just see the world differently than you. They're not, there's no wrong, they're just different, right? Well, within reason, right? There's some wrong out there. But, uh, but I would say that, like, for the most part, most of the things that we argue about, it's not that we're... We are just seeing the world in different ways, and we don't know how to communicate that to each other, mm -hmm. you know. And so, I would say that's like my biggest weakness and the thing that I've been working on the most. What's uh, what's kind of your outlook or um, take out on nutrition? Is there kind of a specific nutrition protocol or, or regimen that you have personally? You, if somebody asks you about it, you kind of like to share, or what's kind of what are the principles for for your per personal nutrition and what you would uh, kind of put out there in, into the into the world. Nutrition's hard for me because I think that people become very dogmatic about it. For sure. And so it's like if you were taught to count macros, then you think that's the way, right? And then you might if I what I see a lot is like these people they 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 get dug in about their methodology, and I'm like, look, be strict on results, but this whole like you should be flexible on methods and diet is so nuanced. Our bio biology is like. We have some of the, some of the same characteristics because we're the same animal, for sure. But we have very different tolerances, yes. and so um, I don't. I actually think everybody, and this is a weird advice that I think people cringe at, but I think everybody should do every fad. Do it. Just try it. See how it works. Like you're gonna learn so much about yourself. Like I did macros enough to realize I have so many intolerances that macros will never work for me. Right. And like at the same time, if I do macros, I'm basically just doing paleo. Mm -hmm. Because for me, like I need whole real food or I feel like crap. Right. And so it's like you call it whatever you want, but like everybody's got their nuances. I eat very intuitively, and the only reason I can do that is because I've done enough to know how I respond. Cool. <clears throat> What's the importance of as as a, as an adult, play, free time, and then exploration? Man, you know, I think it's I just put a podcast out about this the other day, but like, I was I was watching my, my buddy's kids play the other day, and I was just like, man, they're so entrenched in their own world. They don't care about anything that's not this Lego fort right now. And I thought like, we, when we're kids, the days last forever. Like, I don't know what your experience was, or most people had some sort of, like for me, I was playing outside in the summer, and my mom would flick the porch light on when it's time to come home. Right. But those nights would last for eternities. Yep. I think because you're so entrenched in the moment. And what I think what happens when we're adult is like we're, we're inoculated to hurry, like into this like lifetime of waiting. We're always like waiting for the next thing. And so I think it's almost lunacy that, you know, we spend in traffic, we're waiting to get there. And at work, we're waiting for our shift to end. Monday through Friday, we're waiting for Saturday. We spend our entire life wishing our time away. And then we wonder where the time went. You got what you want, you wished it away. Mm -hmm. And I think play is the one thing that can reverse that trend for people. Like, people don't, it's not acceptable to just go do, people look at me, I feel that weird ego need to justify snowboarding so much, but the reality is, like, I'm the most alive in that moment. That day lasts forever. I'm exhausted by the end of it. Like, I want everyone to have that, you know? And it's weird, because we're, we're taught not to want to play when we're older. Like, you gotta take care of respons what should you be doing? You gotta take care of your responsibilities. Great and point. it's like, yeah, but how much better of a human might you be if you just took a couple hours to yourself to do something that lose track. You don't need more time. You need activities that make you lose track of time. Yeah. That's what you need. Beautiful. So uh, why Colorado? Why did you decide to, to come out here and, and uh, put down some roots? I did this uh, ideal day exercise, which we do in the Clarity County, where like all things being equal, you just des design your perfect day. Where do you wake up? What do you do? For me, I was in the mountains. Every jaunt to the mountains, like for ultra running and stuff, 
I, what I realized is my whole life turned into waiting like till I could go back to the mountains and it's just where I feel the most alive mental clarity whatever you want to call it and so uh, for me it was a total risk my whole network was in San Diego mm -hmm. my businesses were there like my friends were there but I just was like I got I feel like I got to be true to what I want I got to at least know I got to try it mm -hmm. and then my thought was okay I'm trying it to check the box I'll get here be here for like a month and then I'm gonna go to California mm -hmm. and I got here and I realized like I can't even call myself an endurance athlete here because my recreational friends put me to shame on it's, the weekends. It's intense out here. Man. Yeah, like I'm me and me and my friend Marissa, like there was three days. I was like, we went above thirteen thousand feet, I think like nineteen times in three days on three different modalities. Like we uphill skied, we hiked, and then uh, we downhill skied. And I was just like, I'm never leaving. Yeah, <laughs> this is for yeah. me. Yeah. It's it's it's. Uh, I mean, I've had quite a few uh, ultra runners and things of that nature on the podcast and and you know been in boulder a couple of times and i just i always ask them like you know what's what's so special about colorado what's so special about you know boulder or denver or wherever i'm at interviewing somebody and it's just and and they kind of they say kind of the same thing that i'm going to say is like there's just something unique and magical about the state man and i think a lot of it has to do with going back with community it's like there's so many people that are like-minded in in certain areas like in regards to health and fitness and kind of just the free spirit and, and just kind of exploring like there's so many people that are out here that are like that and then that just seems to attract more of those type of people and it's just like it's because like if you go to boulder or something like that i mean you want to talk about you know ocr athletes um ultra runners tri triathletes like it's it's unbelievable yeah. but i always say from where i live in colorado springs to Denver, to Boulder, like it's the professional athletes, the, the elite, not even the professional athletes, but just the, the everyday average person that loves health and fitness. It's just, it's mind blowing. Like it's just, it's a different culture because I'm, I'm sure, you know, you from being from Maine, I'm from Iowa, it's like, dude, like, you know, there's not really, I mean, there's some beautiful parts of each state and beautiful people and things like that. But overall, it's like, you come out here like, if you're if you're into health and fitness and the outdoors and all that, it's like this is this is just another level. I don't know if there's. I mean, I've been to San Diego, I've been to Southern California, I really like that area, and there's a lot of health and fitness out there. And maybe you could speak on this, uh, Rick, a little bit more. But dude, it seems like Colorado is just another level for for that type of stuff. I mean, well, yeah. what do you think about that compared to maybe even like the San Diego, Southern California, Orange County area? I've thought about it a ton because I'm like, what is what is it about this place? And you know what it is. When I was 13, I remember talking to my mom on the way to a mountain bike race, and I was like every time we go to the mountains, people are nicer. And I just picked up on it when I was a kid. Like, you never, like, snowboarding, very rarely do you see people in a bad mood. Yeah. Ever. Like, so my thing is, like, first of all, I snowboard so much because it's amazing to be around people that are never in a bad mood. Uh, it's a different kind of energy. But I think, you know, I think it is, is when I'm in the mountains, my mind feels like it has room to roam like your body does, right? Something about wide open space. Because if you put clutter, like, in your room, you probably realize this. If your room's cluttered, it transcends the physical space your mind feels cluttered. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something about it that like the mountains permeate the culture because they're so close here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think it is. I think there's a psychological thing that's going on that people don't recognize, which is that idea of who you are in the mountain. There's something about like this recognition of of our natural and habitat, our natural habitat, right? And so I think I think there's something where it permeates the mind of the culture. Cool. And people don't even know it, but they're just a different yeah. kind of human. Yeah. And I know it because I, I go back and forth and I see it. I'm like, you guys don't know what you have, right. you know? It's it's beautiful, man. It's it's amazing. Is there? Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here very shortly, Rick. Cool. Um, is there like kind of one place within the state of Colorado that is just your place that you really enjoy? And, and maybe if it, maybe if it's kind of like a secluded place, you don't want to share it. But maybe if if there's a, another place that. Um, maybe it might be a little bit more well-known. Is there just kind of a place or two that you really appreciate and spend a lot of time at, and if somebody's going to come visit that they they should check out? Vail. Vail? The okay. back of cool. Vail. Back the, of Vail. The back right. bowls in Vail. Like, I don't know if you've been there. I have not. Okay, no. so I've, are, do you ski or snowboard? No, I don't. Okay. Uh -uh. All right, so this is going to be harder to describe then. <laughs> but, That's okay. Some of the listeners will Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll just say it like this. When I was on the lift going to the back bowls in Vail, uh, this guy... Uh, so it was my, I was talking to my friend. So this guy's on the, we're all going to the back bowls of ale. This guy says, careful out there, son. And I was like, oh, like maybe this is a local trying to get me not to be out there or whatever. And he's like, you'll end up spending your life back here. And I'm like, what a weird thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I got through one run of like 
pure powder. And I'm sitting at the bottom and I'm like, I'm almost crying. I've never been so happy. I had this moment of like, I knew what he was talking about. It was like this, this, it's so open back there and incredible and untouched. At least it seems untouched and it's just pure powder and you just have this, I don't know, man, there's something about it. I'm moving to Vail. Like I cool? went there one time and I told my roommates, I was like, I'm moving to Vail next year just so cool. we're clear. No, I, I just want to ask you, how how did you end up uh, in, in Castle Rock? Because everybody's like Denver and Colorado Springs and you know uh, Boulder. and the, So what, what's, what was kind of the impetus to land you here in Castle Rock? I just had two friends that lived there. Oh, okay. And I would call, I hit them up and I was like, hey, would you guys want a roommate? Because I, I figured, you know, I don't want to sign a lease because I don't know what I like yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. So it was like I just jumped in. And it's Perfect. good, yeah. Awesome. Very good. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna ask you uh, probably one more question here, maybe two. But um, what what's your thing, um, Rick? What what is what is kind of the, the the thing, the passion, the jam that just drives you, motivates you, gets you up every day, and then tying into what is the message that you want to leave with with people? If if you if your time on this earth is done tomorrow. What's, what, what do you want to leave this earth with? What's, what's, what's your message? Figure out who you're here to be and step into that person fully because I spent the first 30 years of my life apologizing. And I, and I don't mean that like I wasn't a bad person or anything, but I, I truly, I know I've said this a bunch, but I just didn't fit. So I'm apologizing to girlfriends because I'm into so many different activities. I'm apologizing to school because I can't get myself to read whatever book they wanted me to read. I apologize to everybody and just force myself into this box and I realize how much different life can be when you just accept that you're hardwired a certain way. If, if, whether it fits into the world or not isn't a reflection on your character. It's just a reflection on the world and who they are. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my coping mechanism is to tell people, like, screw you, I'll do it anyway. Right. And I had the biggest realization of my life was realizing, like, you're an adult. You don't have to tell people to screw off anymore. You can just set your life up however you want it to be. So on Monday, if I'm feeling down, I have a break glass button where I work out for six hours and I don't do one thing at work. Cool. And like, I just think people need to accept who they are because when you do, there's just so much, life is just so much more vibrant. Cool, yeah. You're, you're free, right? Yeah, you're free. You're, you're, you're able just to, you're, you're able to be you and to live your life and you're, you're, you're free. I mean, otherwise, and if you're trying to put a, a, you know, a, a square peg into a round hole, it's just like, it's just friction, right? And it's just, it's just, that's, I think that's where a lot of the anxiety in our culture comes in, the fear and just all of this crazy mental stuff is like, like I think it goes back and, and that seems to be the message of this whole podcast is like, who are you? Yeah. What, what, what's your jam? What's your thing? Like, why are you on this earth? Like, there, there's a purpose for all of us. Like, we're not, we're not just here just to, you know, work a nine to five and drink beer after and fall asleep and wake up and do it again. Yeah, but we but, ignore... There's a purpose, man. I think right. we ignore that because we are, it's uncomfortable to think about, right? Exactly. It's like existential it's dread. It's easier just to check yeah. out, right? Right. It's easier just to check out and, and do the nine to five and drink your beer and do it all over again, Watch right? your porn. And that's the easy Use your way. Instagram. Yeah. Like, just do what you're supposed to do. Like, right. of course, right. that's the easy way. Yeah. Stepping outside of that is really difficult, and but there's almost nothing more worthy yeah. to figure out what you're on this earth to do. Right. You know? Yeah. Very cool. Well, Rick, I want to... Just thank you very much for, for your time and uh, hanging out with me for a little over an hour at the Castle Rock, uh, Colorado Library. And um, at this time, if, if there's anything else that you want to share, if there's uh, kind of like how people want, if they want to reach out to you, website, Instagram, any, any sponsors, any, anything like that, the platform is yours. Please go ahead and, and share with the listeners uh, that, that type of stuff. Um, I would just say follow me at Rick Alexander underscore okay. on Instagram. Um, I don't, I post my whole life there. I'm pretty yeah. open person. Um, you know, like, <laughs> this is funny. Like, I don't have a huge platform. I want to, though. Like, I have no shame in saying, like, no, I want to be famous. I want to be, for the simple reason is, like, I want to be able to reach more people and right. tell them that they don't have to apologize for who they are. Exactly. Like, you can, you don't need permission from anyone to do the things you want to do in this world. Um, if you follow me, if you're like, if you're listening to this and you're like, some of this is resonating with you and you're like, maybe I'll buy the book, maybe I'll take the Clarity Academy, the course, whatever, just reach out to me and I'll tell you, because if it's not for you, I'm going to tell you to go somewhere else yeah. and I'll help you get somewhere else. Cool. Like, I'm not here to push you my stuff. I'm not dogmatic about it. I want you to figure out who you are. Just open and real, man, right? Yeah, yeah. Try cool. to be. Cool. Very cool. We, we need, that's, that's some more kind of the whole vulnerability thing and all that. It's more buzzwords in our culture and 
sometimes you get that from people. I, I think a lot of times, even when they're throwing that stuff around, you don't get that. But, dude, when you meet somebody that you know is genuine and real and raw and just straightforward, and, yeah, they have things that maybe they want to try to share with you. But, like you just said, if it doesn't fit, like, hey – Here's another direction. You know what I mean? That's yeah. that's where it's at. Because every you know, and we all have to make money. We have to pay our bills. We all get all that. But a lot of times, people are like, oh yeah, you know, vulnerability in this, and they're, they're trying to pull you in so they can yeah. they can get something from you and make the money. But when it's like, hey, dude, you know what? Yes, I have this to offer, but I don't think you're you're you you, you need to be here. Let's go in that direction. Like that's that's about as real as it gets. You know what I mean? Turning turning customers away that could actually give you money and help out your life. You know? Oh, many like uh, probably half. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. look, I'm not, this isn't for you. Yep. Yeah. And that's cool. Man. Yeah. I, I appreciate being real like that. So, all right, Rick, um, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate um, you kind of opening up and just sharing, sharing some real stuff. It's, it's very valuable. Definitely. I took a few notes and uh, gained, gained some, some cool insight and I, I know the listeners will too. So um, <clears throat> listeners, I just want to, again, thank you very much for tuning in uh, to this episode of the 127 fit podcast. If you guys, want to reach out to me, uh, the best place probably is Instagram. That's at 127fitness. You can also reach out to me on Facebook at Quentin Vars. Then um, if you want to just uh, read up on some of my blogs, the website for that is 127fitness.com. And if you guys could like, subscribe, share, and then most importantly, leave a review, especially within iTunes, that would be greatly appreciated. If you think you would be an awesome guest or if you know a person or two that you think would be an awesome guest for the 127 Fit Podcast, you can um, reach out to me through the social media or you can email me, 127fit at gmail.com. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. I hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day or evening whenever you're listening to this. And per the usual, I will leave you with Proverbs 2410, which states, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. This time until next time, I will catch you guys later.